a speedy recovery. Um, a speedy recovery. Uh, he is suffering. He is recovering from the flu, and his voice is recovering uh, slowly compared to the rest of him. So we wish Rabbi Carrier well. He is providing tech support tonight. Um, the Sinai and Synapsis Project bridges the religious and scientific worlds and offers people a worldview that is scientifically grounded and spiritually uplifting. The project is the intersection of Judaism and science um, and coexisting searches. We hope many of you were with us in September when Dr. T uh, Thomas Rosenbaum, the president of Caltech, shared a wonderful evening of physics and faith. If you would like more information about Sinai and Synopsis, you can go to their website, sinaiandsynapses.org, just spell it out. Um, and they have wonderful presentations. Um, and we will be telling you a little bit more about that at the end. At this time, we are really honored to have this exceptional panel for our second program where we are tackling medical ethics and new technology. And the question, we can do it, but should we? Following the presentation, I will be posing your questions to our panel, which you can post in the chat box. In a moment, I'm going to turn the program over to our moderator who will put all of this to get, who put all of this together, Dr. David Snyder. Dr. Snyder is chair of the Bioethics Committee at City of Hope and Emeritus Professor of Medicine in the Department of Hematology and I'm going to hematopoietic cell transplant. He is also a longtime congregant here at PJTC. I'm pleased to turn the evening over to David who will introduce the other members of our panel. And I'm going to ask you to wait just a minute so I can unmute our panel members. Uh, David, you are unmuted. Okay. Um, Rabbi Dorf, you are unmuted. I should hope. Oh, um, oh no, 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 no. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, we're going to start this again. Um, I should be unmuted. David. Uh, John, I think all of the panel members should except for David should now be unmuted. Um, okay. I think, <clears throat> Ellen, you're unmuted, correct? I yes, and Dr. Zay is unmuted and Rabbi's unmuted. So our panel is all unmuted. If you are not on the panel, please make sure you stay muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention that you can put your questions in the chat. There will be a Q and A at the end. David. All right. Thank you for that introduction, Judy. And it's really my pleasure to uh, serve as a moderator for tonight's topic. It's it's certainly very germane to the overall theme of this uh, series of symposia, and we do have a, a terrific panel. Uh, I want to just kind of lay out the agenda for how we're going to do this tonight. Um, I'll start by introducing our, our panel uh, members and, and ask each of them to give a little bit of a background um, the, for themselves. And then we'll get into sort of introduction of the topic. I'll, I'll set, a, set, set the stage and then each of our three panelists will, will uh, give a little bit of um, the framework from their perspective uh, areas of expertise. Um, we will uh, then sort of drill down to uh, some specific examples of advances in medical technology. Uh, first, dealing with genetic diagnostics and counseling, um, then uh, pre implantation, embryonic cell genetic diagnostics, and finally, uh, gene therapy, and particularly uh, CRISPR technology, which is certainly a very hot topic. So uh, with, with that, um, let me start by uh, introducing our panel members. I'll start with uh, Rabbi Dorf. Um, 
who is the uh, Saul and Ann Dorf uh, Distinguished Professor in Philosophy, uh, Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies at AJU. Um, the author of, of two excellent and very uh, pertinent uh, books. One is Matters of Life and Death, The Jewish Approach to Modern Medical Ethics, which is something I relied on very heavily when I was uh, serving as chair of our ethics committee at City of Hope. And then also a book called Jews and Genes, The Genetic Future and Contemporary Jewish Thought, uh, edited with Laurie Zoloff. So very germane uh, to, the, to this topic. So Rabbi Dorf, can you, beyond that, can you just give us a little bit of uh, introductory comments about your background, your expertise uh, that you uh, bring to the, to the panel tonight? Um, <clears throat> sure, I, um, I'm a rabbi, a conservative rabbi, and <clears throat> I have a doctorate in philosophy from Columbia University with a dissertation in moral theory. Um, and even though my dissertation had nothing to do with bioethics, um, in 1973, when the Supreme Court did Roe v. Wade, uh, may it rest in peace, um, the, um, uh, a friend of mine who was a classmate of mine who was then the uh, Associate Hill Director at UCLA had put together a lunchtime panel at the medical school about abortion. And he had a priest and a doctor and he said to me, can you talk about a Jewish review of abortion? I had read one article about that, but I said, sure, sure for 10 minutes. But then people thought I knew this stuff. And so people started asking me about this. And so I got more and more involved in issues of bioethics. And um, I, I've been on the uh, ethics committee at UCLA Medical Center uh, since the early 1980s. And I've been on three federal commissions having to do with healthcare. Uh, Hillary Clinton's healthcare task force, may that also rest in peace. Um, and the Surgeon General's um, uh, Commission to Reduce uh, sexually, tra sexually Transmitted Diseases, and um, NARPAC, National Human Resources Protections Advisory Committee, uh, Commission to try to um, re re uh, revise the federal guidelines on research on human beings. Um, and I'm now on uh, the state of California's commission guiding stem cell research within the state. Um, and I did those, those two books that, uh, that Dr. Snyder just mentioned. Um, that's enough about me, I think. Okay, Th thank you. Um, Ellen, now I certainly don't need some introduction to this uh, audience from, from our synagogue, but, but for this purpose of the symposium, you can give us a little bit about your background and expertise. Okay, um, I'm a geneticist PhD and a genetic counselor board certified. And uh, it turns out in 10th grade biology, I loved learning about the genes and uh, and, and, and the rats and mice and all that stuff. And I haven't changed from that. I decided that I'm a biologist at heart with a lot of STEM in me. Um, I've worked at various places. I did my dissertation in David Cummings' lab at City of Hope on, um, on attention deficit disorder and Tourette syndrome. Are they genetically related? Yes, they are, which was against what was believed. And I've worked at Children's Hospital and I've worked at um, of uh, 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 various and sundry hospitals in the area. In the last about 10 or 15 years, I've changed to simply uh, giving, uh, doing breast cancer and other cancer as a predictive um, topic so that I can help individuals figure out if they are increased risk for particular cancers and if so what to do about them. So that's why I'm finishing my career, career now and I'm still working. Now at Los Robles Health Center. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, we have Dr. John Zaya. Uh, John is someone I've known for many years, uh, uh, working at City of Hope, and we're we both hail from Boston originally. Um, John, can can you give a little bit of about uh, background of what your current expertise and experience is that's that's germane to these topics? Yes, I am. Um was originally <clears throat> trained uh, in a <clears throat> Jesuit college in Massachusetts, Holy Cross. And from there, I went to the Harvard Medical School and eventually became a pediatrician. Um, I mentioned it that way only because um, of the requirement in college for all of us to minor in philosophy, which is related, I think, in some ways to our topics tonight. Um, but then as a pediatrician, I had an opportunity to work um, at the Center for Disease Control um, 
and uh, became a virologist um, and a pediatrician specialized, I guess, in viruses anyways. But um, then I became a card carrying um, uh, virologist and worked on vaccine development and that sort of thing. Um, and in 1980, moved to um, City of Hope because I was working on immun the immunity of cancer patients to viruses. And they had a particular, you have a different particular problem with, with handling viral infections if you're and getting chemotherapy, especially chicken pox and those diseases of childhood. Um, so here in LA in 1980 is when AIDS appeared. And so I became more and more involved in AIDS. Um, and I was studying a, a virus called cytomegalovirus, which was a particular problem in, in David's patients, the bone marrow transplant patients. Uh, and at that time, about one third of all of the city of Hope bone marrow transplant patients were dying of cytomegalovirus. So it was a combination of, of HIV and CMV and working on those entities that eventually led me to uh, gene therapy, which uses viruses to deliver genes for uh, correction of some problem. Um, and from that standpoint, we were, what we were doing is we were altering the bone marrow of AIDS patients to protect those cells against HIV. And so we actually have tr transplanted uh, several patients with genetically modified cells that were protected just to see if our cells could go into the patient and be curative. And we know that you can cure an AIDS patient if you give them enough bone marrow uh, from a person that is genetically protected. Um, and so that's how I got into this whole area of gene therapy. So right now I'm the, the director of the Center for Gene Therapy at City Pope. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I, I think, as I, I said, we have definitely a, a very well-qualified panel to help us uh, deal with, with uh, the issues of, of, uh, in front of us tonight. So uh, it's, it's clear to everyone that we're uh, you know, living through an age of technologic and informational uh, revolution, uh, where changes uh, in these areas that are developing at an exponential uh, rate. And, and often the speed of these technological uh, breakthroughs outpace you know, society's ability to understand the implications fully and to put in guardrails and protections that are, that are, that are needed. Um, uh, clearly people doing research in these areas are motivated to do good. Well, we certainly hope so, uh, to do good for individual patients as well as for uh, the population and society in general. But we always have to worry about you know, the flip side of unintended consequences, either un unintentional uh, side effects from drugs, uh, off-target effects from so-called targeted therapy. Um, and then of course, there are people with malicious uh, or reckless intent who want to take advantage of new technologies for evil gains, if you, if you will. Um, there may be you know, well-intended well-intended uh, researchers or scientists, physicians, who nonetheless, uh, it, through their intervention to trying to, to help uh, people actually have uh, negative uh, consequences that were un unexpected. And I'll give one example is, is the story about sickle cell screening. This, this was um, something that goes back to uh, the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, it was in Boston and, and other cities uh, and actually involved the, uh, the Black Panthers. So when, when scientists were able to uh, figure out how to screen for sickle cell uh, trait, you know, sickle cell uh, disease, of course, is a very uh, serious disease. I think John might talk about it more later, both in terms of morbidity and, and early mortality. And uh, it, it, you know, people may be carriers of the sickle uh, trait, and it takes two copies of the gene uh, to uh, manifest as as disease, as, as as Ellen will expand on. So, you know, physicians in Boston area at that time thought, "Oh, look at this is such a serious and difficult disease. Now we have a way to screen for it." And we're going to offer this to the population, which was mainly the black population of, of, the, of that community, which is where, mainly where sickle cell resides. And we're going to offer this screening and help them 
uh, to avoid you know, these, these terrible um, diseases. Well, that was their intention. The, the, unfortunately, the, what the, the interpretation of this effort from the black community was that, oh, what are these mainly white male you know, physicians, scientists trying to do to us? They want to scream for this disease and tell us we shouldn't bear children. They want to basically, you know, wipe us out. It's a form of genocide, is, is, in a sense. And that's that was the severe backlash from the uh, black community that you know the physician scientists clearly had not uh, anticipated. Uh, you could, we could probably talk about more current model about mRNA vaccines for COVID, let's say, and all of the the, the strange political, social, and other reactions that have gone on that, that no one ever really expected. Uh, so that's, that's, that's certainly a, a, a concern. Um, now let's talk about the two main areas. I, I'm not gonna talk about sort of electronic technological advances. I mean, you all probably have your little device in your pocket, which you know, says more than anything I could say about how far we've come. Uh, in, these, in this area, and by the way, please mute your, your phone uh, if you haven't already. Um, and you know that, that's an area which again has tremendous potential for good, but there's also the flip side of you know, cyber warfare and ransomware and malware, all, all of that. Um, now in the genetics revolution, you know, this has been a, a, an amazing advances in being able to diagnose and potentially treat a number of diseases, particularly with genetic basis. Um, you know, the uh, so-called Human Genome Project, which went on from October 1990 to April 2003 to, to sequence the entire human genome. And the thought was, boy, if we could only do that, then we could figure out in every disease, you know, where the, that has a genetic component, you know, where is the abnormality? Is there a mutated gene or a missing gene? And if we can do that, then that could lead to uh, intervention uh, and, and treatment and, and hopefully uh, cure. Um, and, and we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the, the uh, ways that this has been uh, put, to, put into practice, but also uh, particularly when we talk about gene therapy, what, what some of the concerns are for potential uh, misuse. Um, stem cell technology, Rabbi mentioned uh, that, and, and that's been a, a huge uh, advance there in understanding uh, sort of the plasticity of, of cells, how uh, cells that have so-called pluripotential that can you know, differentiate into any type of cell in the body uh, can be pushed into one direction or another, and even the other way around, how more committed adult cells can be that are pushed back into a, a more pluripotential state. And all of the potential benefits and uses of, of that kind of um, technology, uh, as well as the potential for, for abuse, uh, are things to, to be concerned about. I, I'm gonna give you just two sort of fictional scenarios to, to, to give you, a, to sort of tweak your brain a little bit, uh, to think about some of these dilemmas. Uh, there was a play uh, that was in Pasadena and then on Broadway not too long ago called The Twilight of the Golds. Uh, not the gods, but the golds. And, and, and uh, for those who've seen it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of describe it and I'm gonna give a, a um, little spoiler alert if you haven't seen it and you might like to one day, so I don't give, you, give away the ending. But basically it's about a story about a family, the golds. There's a young couple. The woman is a, a researcher. She's a biochemical genetics uh, researcher. And she's trying to isolate the, quote, the gay gene. And she is actually successful, she thinks, in, in identifying the gay gene. Of course, that's, that's, that's fiction, but, but for the purpose of the, the, the story. Now, she happens to be pregnant. And, uh, and the other element is that she has a brother who is gay. And so that's, that's the conflict, that's the dilemma. She has found a way to do in utero diagnosis and to find out whether the fetus she's carrying has the gay gene. And the question is first, will she do the test? Uh, number one and number two, if she does the test and finds that the fetus does have this gay gene, what was she going to do? 
There was no CRISPR available to edit it, but the only consequence would be to abort the fetus. And of course, there's all this conflict with her, with her brother and her parents. You know, she loves her brother. Uh, her brother, though, can't, can't accept or conceive that she might actually choose to abort a fetus because it has the gay gene. How could she possibly do that? So that's, that's the dilemma that's put forward in the play. And, and here's the spoiler alert. If you don't want to hear uh, how it ends, maybe uh, put me on mute or something. But uh, at least in this play, she decides to abort the fetus uh, that, that is carrying the gay gene. And of course, all the consequences with her brother and the rest of the film. So as I said, that's a, that's a fictionalized scenario, but not too far away from, from the truth of where we are uh, today. Um, another scenario is you know, now with the, uh, the human genome sequenced and all, uh, people have thought about this scenario where everyone will have their human genome, their, their own personal genome uh, sequenced and you'll have a chip. You know, you carry, you have a, instead of a dog tags, you'll have your genome chip. And when you go to a man and a woman go to city hall to apply for a marriage license, their chips will be compared. And if they both have recessive genes for a particularly devastating disease, um, they will not be granted a marriage license. So that, that's kind of a big brother 1984 kind of a, a scenario, but again, another, another um, uh, version of, of these issues. So with that as, as my introduction, I'm going to turn to our panelists and I'm going to start with, with Ellen, who's going to uh, give us a bit of a framework of what we're talking about when we're talking about genes and genetic components of disease. Um, and then we'll go to John to, to give, give us the basics about uh, the gene therapy issues that he's involved with. And then we'll turn to, to Rabbi Dorf to, to give us a a framework from the medical ethics and particularly the Jewish medical ethics uh, point of view of how, how we can approach or try to approach some of these uh, issues. So Ellen, why don't you start? Okay, I am going to start really, really basic, basic because I had genetics in 10th grade high school and I'm suspecting that some of you have not had anything about it since then. So I'm just going to start at the beginning. And I do this when I see patients as well, because I never assume that someone knows something and I want to make sure we're on the same page. So the gene is, quote, unquote, the building blocks of our bodies. And they do cellular processes and they're on the uh, chromosomes. And we got one of each from our, our father or sperm donor, whatever it is these days, and one each from our mother or similar donor person. But, but, and so we have two of each of them with the exception of some of the genes on the X, Y chromosomes, which we're not gonna involve ourselves with now. Um, when something goes wrong, when some of these genes are not functional, it can lead to pretty major problems with the body, which is why we're talking about what we can now do about these in 2022, where we're, we're getting to new techniques. But in the past, we did not have that many choices. And one choice was if you, um, as, uh, as was just mentioned about the quote unquote J gay gene, the only choice at that time was to abort the fetus. Now we can do a few other things as pre-implantation genetics, which is expensive, but you look at the zygote, the combination of egg and sperm in the test tube, not in the body, and you see if, it, if that is carrying a gene that you don't want replicated, that is going to be disastrous to the fetus, and you can either abort or um, or choose to, uh, to continue the pregnancy. You can also um, examine the um, fetus, cells from the fetus, which is done with amniocentesis. And if there's a problem in the fetus at that time, if it's not fixable, you can choose to abort. Or if you know that you're carrying a disastrous gene and your partner also has the same one, you can do things like use um, donated sperm. 
there's at least one very religious Orthodox Jewish group in New York who only, it's all arranged marriages in that community, and they only introduce the young people to someone who does not carry the, the same mutated gene that they have, just to avoid the problem of the two negative alleles getting together and resulting in a very effective fetus. Um, Tay-Sachs was one of the major first ones, and that was a huge problem for Ashkenazi Jews. And then we were able to figure out who carried an abnormal Tate Sachs genes, but it was still the same choices. You either did not have children, you donor sperm, or examined the, I'm, I'm not even sure at that time that we could do amniocentesis and examine the, the, the fetus. As, as, as it was developing. Another um, difficult one is cystic fibrosis. And Ashkenazi Jews are at increased risk for particularly five difficult autosomal recessive uh, genes. In contrast to autosomal recessive is autosomal dominant, which takes only one abnormal gene to, to produce an affected fetus. And Sometimes these are later on, um, later in life onset, but one of the ones is a chondroplasia, the dwarfs you often saw in the circus, and that that sometimes is inherited if one of the spouses is a chondroplastic dwarf, but most often it's an ac accidental that happens in um, in the in the sperm or egg, and it's not expected and not planned. Uh, so we've not come actually that far with how to handle these these risks that we have. What what I do is mostly I work with cancer now, and we have mutated genes in the can in in cancers. And I think many of you in the audience know about BRCA one, BRCA two. But Myriad Labs had a patent on that until 2013. And those were the only two that could be tested for. And the price was $4,000 or $6,000. And now the price for a full panel of tests, about 90 genes that make cancer more likely, is $250 and often covered by insurance. So we've come a very long way from being able to identify people at increased risk for cancer. But we still have those same choices. Do we want to give birth to a child who has a 60% chance, let's say, of, uh, of having breast or ovarian cancer? And often they're earlier than, uh, than normal population times. Onset can be 40 or even earlier. We can identify these people. We can't fix it. Um, as, as most of these are later onset, adult onset, that we can do such things as increased surveillance, increased screening, uh, prophylactic surgery, removing well, well parts that are likely to be, become diseased. We now have the dilemma with um, the two first genes that were identified that increased breast cancer risk, BRCA1, BRCA2, as somewhere between a 40 and 60% chance of a carrier having breast or or ovarian cancer. Now we have moderate impact genes where the risk instead of the 12% of the general population might be 20%, 24%. And so there's a range of how impactful these genes are going to be. So if we had ways that we could repair the genes or prevent the disease genes from being expressed, we would not have to deal with the choices that we have now. And so we'll be talking about that some more later. And that's it. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much. I think it brought everyone up to speed. Um, John, do you, do you wanna give us uh, some basics about uh, some of the techniques involved in, in gene therapy uh, that you, you mentioned briefly in your introduction? Uh, um, and we'll we'll save we'll save the CRISPR for the end as the main discussion. But uh, but be, before that, what what other techniques have you been dealing with? And and, and particularly, I know you've you've worked from the institution with with the NIH and the FDA 
just to give people a sense of, of how new technologies, new treatments, or what kind of uh, you know, screening and regulatory um, guard, guardrails are in place that you have to go through to bring a new, a new therapy uh, to, to the bedside. Uh, okay, good. So as I referred to, if you wanna put a gene into a person's body, um, because the, the, the gene that the person has already, let's say they make red blood cells, they have sickle cell anemia. So they're missing a, a certain gene. You can correct that by kind of blunt force by putting that gene into a virus that would normally infect a bone marrow cell that would make the red blood cells. And in doing that, you infect it with a live virus. The virus can't replicate, but it has the ability still to become part of the DNA. And so you kind of push this gene, the corrected gene now, into a, a space in your DNA. It's not the physiological space, that is not the normal space, but you have now integrated it into those cells, those stem cells. Those stem cells will now make new cells. They'll make white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets. And the red blood cells now are corrected and they can make red blood cells. So using this method, and, and I call it a crude method, uh, it's quite sophisticated, obviously, but with, the way it was done is they took an HIV virus that normally integrates into the bone marrow and they removed any of the genes that were uh, pathological, let's say, the, the, and the virus couldn't replicate. It can't make you have AIDS, but it still left the integrase, the, the integration function of the virus. So now with the corrected gene, the virus carries it into the cell, puts it into the DNA, and it integrates there and stays there. So the problem is it may have integrated into a site that normally has some other function. Let's say the function is to control the, the normal growth of that cell. And if you block that or you, you, you disturb that control, uh, you could get unbridled growth of the cell. You get leukemia. And that's exactly what happened in some of the early patients that were uh, treated in this way. Um, things were improved. The vector, we call these vectors. And the, now, and the current vectors are uh, quite good. We have not had any. Uh, production of leukemia or lymphoma in due to the virus uh, in this process. But in the treatment of people that have problems with their bone marrow, like people with anemia, could be sickle cell disease, it could be thalassemia as well, which is a big, big area of, of interest uh, because of the problem of managing such patients. <clears throat> um, the, the bone marrow itself can be um, diseased that is by many years of, of having to continuously produce a lot of red blood cells, um, it just gets to be a, a pathological marrow that, that is predisposed to having some problems and it could be leukemia and lymphoma. So what's happened is there are companies that are treating sickle cell disease, sickle, treating thalassemia uh, with a lentiviral vector and they have very successfully cured these patients. Uh, but some of them have gotten leukemia or lymphoma. And so that's what's delayed the whole approval. But it's likely that this year, the treatment of thalassemia will be approved using a lentiviral vector in the United States. It was already approved about two years ago in Europe. Now, the problem with that is, in addition to the potential risk of getting a leukemia or lymphoma, um, the, cost of the of the treatment is approximately $2 million. That is a cost that's been generated by the companies um, in, a, in consideration of what it takes to normally take care of these patients for, a lot, for their lifetime. If they're going to live 40, 50, 60 years, it takes a lot of money to give them transfusions and to take care of their, their disease. So in Europe, the treatment of thalassemia has been rejected using gene therapy. They said, we can't afford it. And all of the, the, country, the countries basically are um, under governmental control in terms of what they'll accept and what they can afford. And they say, we just can't afford this. So the company is called Bluebird Bio. The, blue, the value of Bluebird Bio uh, plummeted when that, that occurred. It was worth billions of dollars until that, 
that moment. But Bluebird Bio hopes to um, get approval in the United States for the treatment of thalassemia and then for Bluebird, and then for um, uh, thalassemia, I mean, then for sickle cell disease. <clears throat> Okay, so that's the that's called that that the crude way of doing gene therapy. But what if you could be more selective and go exactly to the right space in the DNA? Because the DNA is basically one long string with about three billion um, parts to it, three billion um, nucleo, uh, nucleic acid entities, um, and but some of those nucleic acids are out of order, and so you can go in specifically and correct them. So that's what CRISPR does. And you don't need a virus to do that. You could take the cells and just deliver the protein and the RNA that's part of this assembly that we call CRISPR. So that's the, um, the idea. The, the value of, of CRISPR is it may revolutionize the ease at which you can do these procedures. In fact, all of you for, for $638 can buy a CRISPR kit. And if you're a teacher, of course, you can use it to teach the process in your classroom. Um, but you don't need to, you can actually do it in your garage. And people have done that uh, using CRISPR's uh, uh, kits to do certain changes in, in cells. So David, so that's the background. Um, do you want me to go into CRISPR or should we? Let, let's come back to that. Okay. okay. Um, mm -hmm. But thanks for the for the, uh, the, the, the comments that you, you've given us so far. And we'll, we'll, we'll return to CRISPR. Uh, I want to now turn to, to Rabbi uh, Dorf and, and, and sort of shift a little bit of our focus to, um, you know, the, what do, how do medical ethics and in particular Jewish medical ethics uh, help help us approach some of the, the the concerns that we have for, you know, the basic principle of beneficence of doing good and non maleficence do no harm. Um, at sort of at the level of the individual patient and at the broader, larger level of society as a whole. Uh, if you can give us a framework for, for helping us with that. Okay, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and then get to the, the, to the cases at hand. Um, the why Jewish medical ethics, what's wrong with regular medical ethics? And the answer is that there's nothing wrong with regular medical ethics. It's just that in America, uh, that's based upon Western liberalism. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, right? So and Jefferson cribbed that from John Locke. Um, and, and so as an American, um, and I'm very, by the way, very proud to be an American for a whole series of reasons, even though there've been a number of bumps along the way like slavery and anti-Semitism, but still, um, we are the most pluralistic society that has ever existed on the face of the earth. Um, a friend of mine who's a priest told me that in the Los Angeles Archdiocese, mass is offered in 80 different languages. So, I mean, we are really humanity, you know, together um, uh, in, in America, and we've managed to live together more or less, um, you know, uh, as multiple societies. But as an American, I'm an individual with rights. The classical Jewish story is Exodus Sinai. We leave Egypt not as individuals, we leave as a community. And when we get to Sinai, we don't get a single right. We get 613 commandments. That's the beginning of Jewish guilt. Um, but it also, as my Catholic friend said, you know, we really don't know anything about guilt. They have that cornered. So I'll just leave it for that. Um, but the point is that in the Jewish tradition, <clears throat> we, are, uh, we, are in, we are members of a community with duties as opposed to, as in contrast to individuals with rights. Now, sometimes rights and duties are reciprocal. So if I have a right to my jacket, then you have a duty not to steal it, right? But rights and duties are not always reciprocal. My, my, my duties to my children are different from my duties to my parents, for example, right? And in any case, if I get up in the morning and I'm an individual with rights, then the world owes me. But if I get up in the morning and I'm an, a, a member of a community with duties, then I owe the world. So these two pieces, uh, some pieces of the American ideology and the Jewish idea, ideology do in fact overlap. Uh, like for example, the, the notion that law governs everybody in society, including the head of society, whether it be a king or president or something like that. The notion that each individual is uh, to be respected. Um, 
for different reasons in the American understanding of things and the Jewish understanding of things and the American understanding of things because I'm a reservoir of rights and the Jewish understanding of things because I was created in the image of God. But in each of them, in both of these ways of looking at the world, uh, each individual is to be respected and preserved to the extent that we can, right? Um, one of the things that, that comes out of this, this comparison, is that in the American understanding of things, I own my own body. This is the Nancy Cruzan decision, for example, of the US Supreme Court in 1990, right? So any adult can refuse any medical intervention, right? This is not true for children, but it is true for adults. That doesn't mean you have the right to demand any medical intervention, but you do have the right to refuse any. Whereas in the Jewish tradition, my body belongs to God. Um, and I have my body and a fiduciary relationship with God. That is, God trusts me to take care of my body. So as a result, um, while I might, in the American understanding of things, I might take advantage of some of these preventive genetic, um, um, genetic uh, interventions or curative um, genetic interventions, but I don't have to, it's up to me. Uh, I can choose to let my body you know, disintegrate basically. I mean, uh, in the American understanding of things, I can choose to, um, I, well, I was about to say, I can choose to abuse drugs or alcohol, uh, or smoke, although you can in California can cannot even smoke on Virginia on Venice Beach. I mean, we're way ahead of the rest of the country on that, um, right? But let me to give you one one easier example um, uh, that is more more uh, uh, connected to me. Um, um, and I, I don't know of any any law in America that would that would prohibit me from eating a half a gallon of ice cream every night of the week. And I'm, I'm, I'm severely tempted to do that. And as long as I'm doing it, it is, might as well be mint chocolate chip or cherry Garcia, that stuff is so good. Um, but as a Jew, I don't have a right to do that because that would be undermining the health of my body and that my body's not mine, it belongs to God. So I have this fiduciary um, obligation to take care of my body, right? So in the same sort of, and then, the other piece of this that's really important for our purposes is that the Jewish tradition understands um, medicine as being not only a good thing, but something that every, every society needs to foster. So going back to the Talmud, um, a Jew may only live in a community in which there is a physician. Because when you get sick, you need to have somebody who's, who has expertise in medicine to help you prevent disease and also to cure it to the extent that human beings can. And there are a whole host of rabbis um, through the Middle Ages into the modern period who are also physicians. Maimonides is probably the most famous, but there are a lot of them. Um, that doesn't happen so much anymore because, uh, well, rabbinical school still takes more or less the same amount of time as it did long ago, but medical school takes much, much longer. I was at a conference at the University of Virginia Medical School and the dean said to us, in Mr. Jefferson's medical school, how long do you think it took to become a doctor? Answer, one year. Because in the 1700s, that's all they could teach you, right? Now it's four years of pre-med, four years of medical school, a year of, of, of internship, usually three years of, of residency, all of that, right? So there are not a lot of MD rabbis. There are some. Um, but, but it's simply because medicine has exploded in its ability to do things. And we just heard some of that in terms of genetics. Now, what does that mean? That means that to the extent that I can use any of these uh, preventive me mechanisms in order to avoid diseases, especially, um, especially lethal or, uh, or, um, or, or really serious diseases, I, I not only have a right to do that, but I actually have a duty to do that. Um, and beyond that, I have a duty to make sure, again, Judaism is much more communitarian. I'm a member of a community with duties. So we have an obligation to try to help others be healthy as well, right? I'm not in this, I'm not, I don't live on an isolated island. I live in a community with all kinds of relationships and duties that come from that relation, those relationships. So I have a duty to support um, the, um, the ability of the, of the community to, um, to foster the health of all of its members, right? Now that duty has to be balanced against other duties of the community, like roads and bridges and 
and public safety and education and culture and all kinds of other things, right? I mean, it's not the only duty that the community has, but it is one of the duties that is inherent in terms of the way that, that as a Jew, I have to understand my relationship to medicine and to preventive medicine. Um, I want to, um, to get to the, the kinds of things we're talking about. Um, I'm gonna tell you, um, you know, two personal stories. Um, uh, I think Ellen mentioned Tay-Sachs, right? Uh, my wife and I have four children, girl boy, girl boy, as it happens. Um, and my younger uh, daughter uh, and her husband were thinking about getting married, getting, uh, having children. Um, and my son-in-law found out from his sister that she was a carrier of Tay-Sachs. Um, so she was, uh, so he was tested and he was also a carrier of Tay-Sachs. Um, so my daughter had to be tested. Um, and this was 22 years ago, 23 years ago, actually now. Um, and um, first test, inconclusive. Second test, inconclusive. So that meant that Marlon and I had to be tested. At the time I was 58 and she was 57. So we went to Cedar sinai to be tested. And the nurse looked at us and said, you guys planning on having children? <laughs> right. And I said, you know, been there, done that. <laughs> okay. Um, but we, were, we both tested negative. So uh, my daughter and her husband have three children. They're both, all three of them are healthy, but they themselves are gonna have to be tested uh, when they want to have, when they get married and, and want to have children, because uh, they may well be carriers, right? Um, second story, um, my younger son is a physician. And uh, when he and his wife were planning on having children, they, this is again, 20 years ago, um, they got tested for the Jewish genetic diseases and uh, got a clean bill of health. And then they had a son uh, who has fragile X? Fragile X was at the time was was no well, still is as far as I understand no no more common among Jews than it is among the general population. Although it is a fairly common genetic disease in the general population, and even at the time in Israel they did test for it. Now, given the fact that testing is much cheaper and much more available, uh, you're able to test for many many more diseases with a simple swab of your cheek. Um, now they would that would they would have known that ahead of time, right? But they did not know that, and so their first child is a son with fragile X, who is now 18 years old. Uh, after he was around 13 or 14, he had to be institutionalized because the hormones were doing their thing, and he became violent because he he has the mind of a third grader, um, and um, and because that's what fragile X does. There's a lot of a lot of delays, both physical and mental. Um, and it's a, uh, and so they did pre-implantation genetic diagnosis uh, to see about having a second child the, free of the disease. Uh, and at the time uh, they, they hyperovulated my daughter-in-law and took sperm from my son, put them together in a Petri dish and sent them off. There were only two places at the time, one in Detroit, one in Chicago, that, that had uh, some success in determining whether embryos uh, were free of the disease or not. Uh, so they sent it off, I think, to the one in Chicago. And of the 10 embryos, they were only sure about one of them that was free of the disease. They implanted that one, and that's my granddaughter, um, who thankfully is free of the disease. Um, she's now 13 years old and, and all of that, right? Um, but it's a, my daughter-in-law got pregnant after that, and they aborted because they were afraid of having another fragile X child. And, um, and you can imagine that uh, dealing with a fragile X child, well, I'll, I'll tell you, is uh, takes a, not only a lot of time, effort, and money, um, but it also is, psychologically is really hard for their daughter who has had to be in therapy uh, throughout all of this. Um, and, it's, um, and they worry a lot. My daughter and son-in-law, my, my son and daughter-in-law worry a lot uh, about what's going to happen when my grandson turns 21 um, and will no longer be uh, supported by the school district in this particular facility where he is being supported now. Um, and it's a, and that you know, leads to all kinds of questions about uh, inheritance and 
and um, and try, you know, setting up trusts in order to medical trusts to take care of him, you know, after they're no longer on this earth. Um, and you know, it's a very uh, these things bring not only medical issues, but they bring all kinds of psychological and financial issues as well. Um, so um, it is the case that, but I remember when they were thinking of doing pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and my son said to me, but what does that mean about our relationship to our son? Does that mean that we have uh, less, um, less love for him because he has fragile X? And I said to him, you have to distinguish between, um, you know, between uh, uh, before the fact and after the fact. Right um, after the fact, if you have a child that has any kind of disability, you, we ha you have the duty to do as much as you possibly can to enable that child to live as as fruitful a life and as as wonderful a life as that child can have. Right, but before the fact, you you have the, the not only the right but the duty to try to prevent serious diseases. Um, and so this is not a uh, this is not a, 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 a Doing this pre-implantation genetic diagnosis in order to have a child without this genetic um, disease is not saying anything about your love for Amiel is his name, right? Um, but rather, it is a way of trying to prevent disease in the next generation. So it's the twilight of the goals, except it's not for the gay gene; it's for the fragile X gene. Um, and so there you have not a fictional uh, situation, but an actual situation. Uh, that happened in my own family. Um, and the, uh, so in, certainly in terms of genetic testing, I'm one of whatever, 160 rabbis or something in Southern California has, that has signed on to this ad gene test now, right? In other words, that couples thinking of having, um, or for that matter, individuals thinking of having uh, children should be genetically tested um, so that they can try, they can prevent uh, this, uh, prevent genetic diseases. Uh, in their offspring. It doesn't mean they can't have offspring. It just means that they need to take these extra precautions um, to make sure that it happens. And why is that the case? I mean, it's not, why are Jews especially susceptible to these, uh, these diseases? Uh, it's because of what's called the founder effect. Um, back in the, in the 1700s, um, Ashkenazic Jews were, uh, were limited to the pale of settlement. Um, and which was uh, Western Russia uh, and, and Eastern Europe, and um, and they and so uh, there were and there there was there was a very small number of them, um, and they mated with each other, uh, and so you had a lot of mating of well, my own grandparents were first cousins. Uh, my wife says that explains a lot about me, but anyway, uh, the um, but and, and that happened a lot. Uh, and as a result, the kind of um, the, the kind of protection that you get from one generation um, um, contrib leading to a genetic disease in the next generation um, by having various kinds of marriages of people who are not related to each other, that didn't happen. And so what you got was this founder effect where the, the same, you know, the, the, these genetic diseases then got transmitted from one generation to the next. That's the reason why Ashkenazic Jews have these Ashkenazic Jewish diseases. That said, that doesn't mean that we are a diseased population. I mean, even in the case of Tay-Sachs or familial dysautonomia, which are by far the most um, prominent of the Jewish genetic diseases, it's three tenths of 1% um, of Jews who, um, who have this allele. Now that's 10 times the amount in the general population. But that still means, I mean, it's sorry, 3% as opposed to three tenths of 1% in the general population. But that still means that 97% of Jews are, do not have the Tay Sachs gene, right? So, I mean, Jews should not see themselves as a diseased population, but Jews should see themselves as, as requiring, both in the, from the point of view of just American pragmatism, but also on the basis of a Jewish uh, uh, obligation to take care of yourself. And, prevent disease when you can, uh, should definitely get tested before they begin to have children. Okay, Rabbi, thank you very much for that uh, uh, your contribution. 
Um, I'm looking at the, the time. I'm going to, I, I want to give one more example uh, to add to the rabbi's example and then uh, turn to a, a brief discussion again about CRISPR and then we'll open it up for the questions uh, from, from the audience. So um, I want to share a, a, a real a case that came to us at City of Hope uh, to our ethics committee. Um, and this was a young <clears throat> Jewish couple from New York who had fertility uh, difficulties and they went through in vitro fertilization uh, process and they had a number of embryos that were uh, collected and stored and they were successful uh, with the pregnancy. And unfortunately, uh, their young daughter at age two years old developed uh, leukemia. And this could be, you know, a particularly virulent form of the disease, and and she really needed a bone marrow transplant uh, as her best chance uh, for cure. Now, for those of you who know about bone marrow transplantation, to find a donor, you need to have what's called an HLA matched donor. The these are the tissue transplantation antigens. Um, in the old days, it used to be only a sibling would have a chance of being 100% matched with with a particular patient. Uh, now we actually can use a donor who's only half matched, uh, which opens the door to many more patients. But at this time it was full matched or, or not, not at all. And so the question that the, this young couple brought to us, it was, this was some years ago, uh, was number one, uh, technically, would it be possible to perform HLA typing on the different embryos that were frozen uh, to and then to select, uh, that, that was the first question. Was it technical, technologically feasible to do that kind of testing? Um, and, and let me add addition, there was a, a gene that uh, increased the propensity for leukemia that the affected uh, girl uh, carried. So they wanted to be able to detect one of the embryos that was HLA match and did not carry this gene. That was the technological question. The more philosophical, ethical question and, and this is, a, this is a Jewish couple, was um, can they or may they uh, make a choice of, of an embryo on this basis? Would that be allowed? And, and, and for that issue, they, they turned to rabbinical counselors rather than the, uh, the um, uh, physicians. From the technological point of view, the answer was yes, uh, a single cell from a, an embryo can be taken out and this type of genetic analysis can be performed on this single cell without negatively impacting the you know, potential future development of that embryo. And so yes, a, a, an embryo could be selected uh, for those criteria to be able to basically create a new child who potentially then could be a donor for uh, the affected uh, si sibling. In terms of the uh, ethical point of view, maybe I'll, I'll turn to, to Rabbi Dorf. How, how would you uh, counsel them about, about those issues? I think you've um, spoken to it. Uh, well, I mean, as long as they're, um, you know, they're planning on implanting usually, what is it, three uh, embryos uh, normally these days when, when you do IVF, um, there's, they're, they're gonna have to choose among the 10 or so that they have anyway, right? Um, and, and, and as long as they are going to, um, you know, to have this child and raise this child fully as this child, right? In other words, you're, you're not just using this child for the sake of the, of the, uh, of the daughter, right? Uh, who's affected with leukemia. The, this child is gonna be loved at, for him or herself and raised as such. So this is not, you know, to, if you wanna use Kantian ethics, this, this is not, um, just using the child in a kind of I it way, boober, right? You're, you're not, you know, using it, but rather you're you're gonna going to raise the child with full respect for this child, and you know, then then it seems to me that there's not that'll be fine. Um, in other words, that they they may choose this this embryo. They're gonna have to choose anyway, um, and they may may as well choose an embryo that that will have uh, a double blessing, God willing. Uh, namely that it will save the older child and it will also bring about uh, a, a new child to their lives. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think that's fine. There was a book on this exact same topic. I think is what called My Sister's Keeper. 
I read it quite a few years ago, maybe 20 years. It was the exact same thing. The parents were having a child and they only wanted the child to match the older sibling so they could save the older sibling. And there were, there were just a lot of debate and understanding. Is it ethical? Is it fair to the older, et cetera? It was well, a wonderful I, read. Yeah, Ellen, actually that, that was a case at City of Hope. Um, John Zaya probably remembers it. Uh, there was a young girl about 16, I think, who had a form of leukemia and she needed a transplant. And she had one sibling uh, who was not a match for her. And the parents, uh, the father had had a vasectomy and um, they, they searched, I think, also for unrelated donors and couldn't find anyone that matched. And so the parents made the decision to try to reverse the vasectomy, which I think is only about 10% uh, successful, uh, in order to try to create another uh, child, hoping that the new child would be HLA matched with their affected daughter and that that new child could then be used as, as the donor. And as you said, it, it did turn out that reversal of vasectomy was successful. They had a new uh, uh, baby and they did in, in utero testing before birth. They knew that the baby, that the fetus at the time was in fact HLA matched and the baby was born and ultimately was the donor for her older sister and, and you know, it was a wonderful uh, story. Now, as the ethics committee, we received all kinds of unsolicited uh, flag oh, from oh, yeah. all over the country, um, partic a particular religious viewpoint, I might add, not Jewish, <laughs> who mm -hmm. said, this is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, the one question was, well, what if they did the testing in utero and found it was not an HLA match? Were they going to abort that fetus? That I'm was trying. one. And the second was, Rabbi alluded to this, were they only creating this child in order to be a, a vessel, to, to be you know, a donor child for their other daughter? Uh, and how could, how could you possibly uh, allow that to happen? Um, but I think you know, the rabbi spoke to that uh, issue and, and it was a, a, a very happy ending for, for all involved. Um, I know that now this then 16 year old girl is, 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 is an adult and has sort of dedicated her life to helping others uh, through the Be The Match, you know, bone marrow transplant program and her young, young sibling who was a donor has also devoted her life to, to, to in this kind of uh, field. So it, it was really a wonderful uh, story all, all together. Well, the remaining time before we go to some questions, I just wanted to, to you know, tee up the, the issue again about gene therapy. And you, you've heard terms like uh, precision medicine and uh, personalized medicine. And we've been talking about the, the ability to sequence genes and to uh, in pe people with certain genetically related diseases to, to, to know exactly what the mutation is uh, that's affecting or causing their, their, say their cancer or their hemoglobinopathy. Um, and then you know, op that opens the door to designing therapies, whether in inhibitory therapies or replacement therapies uh, to target that specific you know, defect. And, and it's, it seems like the ideal way of treating people, you, you avoid, all the side effects, the unintended side effects of, you know, uh, uh, injury to other tissues. Um, uh, but that's, you know, that's, it's a lot, that, that's an oversimplification certainly of, of what the, the risks are. Uh, I did work for many years with something called ribozymes and then DNAzymes, which are sort of molecular scissors where you just, in the lab, you synthesize a sequence of RNA or DNA that targets the, the abnormal, the mutated gene. And if you have a way of delivering that to the cells in the, in the test tube or to the body of the patient uh, to attack that mutated gene and, and cut it out and, and thereby wipe out the leukemia. Well, we've come a long way and that's where we are now with, with CRISPR. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it opens all kinds of potential uh, therapeutics. And I'm gonna ask John again to, to return to, to speak about that a little bit. The concerns are that this is such a powerful tool that, you know, are we at risk of quote, playing God? In other words, we have the ability essentially to remove an, a, a mutation, an error. Um, 
And who decides what, what is a, an acceptable target? Uh, you know, cancer, okay, uh, hemoglobinopathies, uh, degenerative neurologic diseases. But what about, you know, other features, uh, a gauging, if there was such a thing, uh, intelligence, height, um, you name it. Uh, now you get into eugenics and, you know, that slippery slope. Um, but John, why don't you, if you want to uh, sort of take us to, towards to the question uh, period here and, and, and give us some of your thoughts about the, the, the potential uh, for CRISPR therapy and, and some of your concerns. Well, <clears throat> the beauty of CRISPR is that it is simple. In fact, it's, it's just chemicals. There's no cells involved necessarily uh, in the actual reaction. And, and when Je uh, Jennifer Dotna, who's a professor at Berkeley, uh, shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Emmanuel Charpentier um, in, in, 2000, um, in 20, 2020. Um, she got the Nobel Prize for chemistry. It wasn't for physiology and medicine. It was for chemistry. This chemistry can be applied in many areas. It can be applied for control of insects, for control of, of new, uh, for production of new plants. If you want short corn, for example, you know, there's new, new corn that's short, so it's six foot tall instead of nine foot tall, much easier to harvest. Uh, you can make that with CRISPRs. Um, you could take pets and, and have designer pets made now that you can do it so simply. I think that's a, an interesting ethical dilemma there as well. You probably can't talk about tonight. Um, but can you do it with the, with the um, embryo pre, prenatal? Well, everyone says, no, we're not ready to do that. We don't know what the effects of this could be. Could there be what they call off-target effects? That is, you hit the target, but you also hit something up off target that could affect brain development or, or whatever. So we don't know enough. So all the distinguished groups, um, um, and I'm sure Rabbi Dorf has actually been part of some of these groups, have advised and made regulations, et cetera, et cetera. And most countries do not allow um, therapeutic use of, of CRISPR uh, for a prenatal. <clears throat> but that's the issue because so many did it, a, a Chinese, um, uh, scientist was concerned with HIV positive mothers who are pregnant. When they have their baby, the baby's not pregnant until the HIV affects it. It can affect it, you know, through breast milk and that sort of thing. But you can you can protect these babies uh, from uh, the exposure during pregnancy, during delivery. But after that, they're home and they may catch it from the mother. Who knows? So he said, I'm going to use CRISPR to knock out the gene that HIV uses to infect. It's called CCR5. That's what we use for some of our trials as well. But he used it in the, uh, in the IVF process. <clears throat> and two babies were born. And it caused a great concern worldwide. Um, the, the person himself was, his name was he, Dr. He, H-E, um, was, disciplined by the Chinese government. In fact, he's kind of disappeared. No one knows what's happened to him. Um, but it has set up um, guidelines, at least for not doing any of this sort of work until we have more experience with CRISPR. And we're getting that experience. There's a company called Vertex that has announced that they've treated about 50 patients that have thalassemia with CRISPR, and they have a very outstanding result. Something 49 out of 50 are cured. Um, there's other companies, of course, that are doing CRISPR for other things like organ transplantation, you can knock out the, the foreignness. That is when you put an organ into a person, you reject it because it looks foreign, but you can use CRISPR to knock out the foreign gene, let's call them, uh, and have a better take of the organ transplant. And, and there's a, a great um, uh, potential in a number of areas, not just curative areas, but of, of making better organ function. Um, there's also a, a, an issue called gene drive. Gene drive is the um, ability of certain genes to allow a organism to predominate in terms of reproduction. And you can knock that out and you could, or you can alter it. You can turn it on with CRISPR or knock it out with CRISPR. And you can, for example, take mosquitoes <clears throat> uh, that can not produce, cannot support malaria. And you can, with this alteration of gene drive, make that mosquito dominate in the population. 
So now you have a population of mosquitoes that cannot transmit malaria. And that's an area that's being um, uh, had very actively developed. The question is, but what happens then? What is that gene? Uh, you know, if those mosquitoes do something else, you know, what if they're dominating and they spread better than the other mosquitoes? I mean, there's, there's these unanticipated consequences that David mentioned that we don't know about. And that's the, that's the concern, I think, that many of the scientists have about some of these uh, applications. But you can apply CRISPRs basically to so many areas right now. From the point of view of the genetic council, there's a concern that is going to be applied selectively so that those who are richer, those who live in bigger towns, those who are better educated, et cetera, will have access to it. And the poor people, the rural people, uh, the less educated will not have equal access. It's to the ethical principle of, of justice, of the, the yeah. equitable uh, allotment of, of a limited or, or scarce resource uh, in an equitable way. Uh, Rabbi uh, Dorf, would, would you like to add any comments uh, uh, to, to this discussion? Well, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think two of the really important issues have just been mentioned, namely, uh, on the one hand, um, well, let me do the, the second one first. The issue of justice is really all over this stuff, right? Namely that because this is new therapy and it's often very costly, uh, it only really is gonna be available in a capitalist country like our own to those who can afford it. Um, it may be different in, uh, in those countries with socialized medicine. Um, and so the, you know, some of the, the, the questions that we're asking now about the justice issues um, may be, may, may fare differently in a place like Canada uh, than it does in the United States precisely because of this issue. Although I must say that um, my wife and I took a, a long time ago, took a trip to Scandinavia and uh, our guide was a, um, a British woman who had married a Norwegian man. And uh, along the way, I, I was talking to her about these issues and she pointed out to me that in European countries, it's really a two tier medical system. Uh, there's the socialized medicine for everybody, and then, then the richer people get insurance for other things that are not covered uh, um, by, the, uh, by the national insurance. Canada has a law against that, um, that you're not allowed to get insurance uh, beyond what the Canadian government provides, but all that means is that people who are wealthy come over the border to the United States in order to get their knee replacement you know, within six months as opposed to six years. Uh, that kind of thing, right? So, I mean, uh, that's the reason to a certain extent why that can work in Canada. But the issues of justice are, are things that, that we are really, really struggling with. And, um, and then the other issue is the, the, youth and a, the um, eugenics issue, right? Namely, it's one thing when we're talking about curing uh, genes for leukemia or fragile X or Tay-Sachs or whatever, right? Uh, it's quite another thing when you're talking about, you know, trying to create the designer child, whatever that is, um, based upon uh, whatever you think is the most valuable kind of child to have. And by the way, if you were doing that, um, say, in the early 1900s, uh, the, the designer child would be uh, somebody who was really good at working in the farm, because the vast majority of us were in America, were working on farms, right? A hundred some years later, the, the designer child is somebody who knows who's good at technology. Um, and all of that is, that's the piece of it that's really very, uh, very worrisome. And as a matter of fact, in the book, if I may, one more time, uh, Jews and Genes, the uh, Genetic Future and the Contemporary Jewish Thought, there's an entire section on what do you mean by, what's the difference between therapy and enhancement, right? In other words, when does, when, does, when do these kinds of interventions really act in a therapeutic way? And, and when, on the other hand, do they act for enhancement? Some enhancements we have no trouble with. I mean, these are an enhancement for my, my sight, right? And yet, I don't think anybody really cares that a lot of us have glasses. Um, but what happens with, with other kinds of enhancements? And when are they kosher, as it were, and when are they not? Um, so that's one of the things they're said. They're, a whole variety of different people who respond to that question in that book um, in a variety of different ways. But that's the other issue. Uh, the other issue is, that, yes, definitely when we're, when we're curing diseases, especially lethal diseases, but then 
what happens? I mean, are you going to do the same thing for people or for children who would be deaf or blind, right? Or short or too tall, right? I mean, where does the line exist as to what is therapy as opposed to what is enhancement? Okay, well, thank you, uh, Rabbi, and, and our other panelists, Ellen and, and John. We're going to have a few questions, and, and maybe Judy can uh, guide us to, to those questions. But I, I just want to say that I hope the people listening, you know, maybe get some comfort from the fact that that these questions are being raised, certainly by uh, esteemed ethicists such as Rabbi Dorf, but also by scientists who are involved in. Uh, the actual field of developing these new techniques and then physicians applying them, uh, whether it's at a local level, physician-patient relationship, one-on-one, -on -one, or at a you know, national or even international level. And of course, there are going to be uh, outliers and, and, and sort of rebels who are going further than anybody else feels it's really appropriate or safe, uh, but they stand out like that Chinese scientist uh, internationally. And, and I think there's a great sensitivity to the inherent uh, risks involved with these kinds of uh, new uh, technologies. Uh, but Judy, do you want to, the uh, limited time we have, do you want to pick out a few questions? Uh, yes, so I, I will start with an easy one. Um, we talked about the Ashkenazi community. Are there diseases prevalent in the Sephardic community? That, uh, you know, is there a, is there a Tay-Sachs in Sephardic Jews? Uh, there are some genetic diseases that are um, more prompt, more common in the, the Sephardic community than in, than in the general population. But first of all, there are many fewer of them. Uh, and it's in part because Jews, the Sephardic community lived among Muslims. And the Muslims were by and large much better, treated Jews much better than the Christians did um, in the Middle Ages and into the modern period. Um, and it, it, I mean, it wasn't wonderful, but in, in, in a number of, and, and Muslim uh, nations varied a lot from those that really persecuted Jews to, but, but the vast majority did not. For the vast majority, we were people of the book. We were Demi, so we were second class citizens. We were not really Muslim. We had not seen the light and, and believed in Mohammed, um, but we did not have to be forcibly converted either uh, the way that everybody else did, um, except for Jews and Christians. So. Um, and in some Muslim, in many, I would say in many Muslim communities, um, Jews were not ghettoized and they were allowed to be part of the general community in all kinds of ways. Um, and what that meant was that um, uh, you had Jews, all, well, literally in the Muslim world, from Morocco to Iran, um, who, uh, you know, who lived in communities that were much more open and diverse than what happened in, in Ashkenazi community. So, so yes, there are some uh, Sephardic um, genetic diseases, but they are uh, much rarer and, um, and, and people from Ashkenazi, um, I mean, from Sephardic communities or from Persian communities um, really need to be tested also, especially because it's so easy now. Okay. So, Rabbi, you began to touch on this, and I know, David, you're also on ethics committees. The line between therapies and human experimentation. How do we delineate that? Is there a beginning to delineate it? Um, aside from the eugenics question, just the, at what point does it become, do we become guinea pigs? Well, I, I'll speak to that some. I think John Zayer can, can also probably speak to it and, and, and Rabbi Dorf. Uh, you know, there's a very uh, formalized process in place uh, at starting at a, each institution has what's called an IRB, Institutional Review Board, that's uh, uh, you know, charged with protecting the rights of individual patients. Uh, in the context of uh, medical treatments. And there's a very multi-step process that, that John is very familiar with in, in taking, say, a new drug, whether it's a genetic-based treatment or uh, another type of a compound that you want a patient to ingest or uh, 
to go from discovering the, the potential value of that in the test tube or in, a, in an animal model to getting it into humans, into patients, it takes many, many steps, uh, you know, regulations through the, the FDA and the NIH uh, and, and many years. Some might argue that it's too many years of, of delay, uh, but uh, so it's, it, it, these new treatments have to be clearly identified as investigational, if you will, experimental, and patients have to be informed fully and give informed consent uh, about the risks and benefits and the, of the treatment, the risks and benefit of alternatives. Um, it's a very uh, in, involved process. Um, John, do you want to speak to that? Uh, all of the um, activities that we hear about right now about CRISPR, for example, since none of it has been approved in Europe or the United States, is research. So are you a, a guinea pig? No, you're actually a humanitarian. And that's what we tell the people that they actually are giving a gift to, uh, to our society um, in, in participating in these current re research experiments. They are experiments though. And we say that right in that consent form, you will not likely benefit from this because we don't know what the outcome is, is going to be. Rabbi, do you want to add? Yeah, I mean, um... I was on the National Human Resources Protections Advisory Commission back in 2000 to 2002, um, uh, uh, re uh, re reviewing and revising the federal guidelines on research on human beings. Um, this was after Jesse Gelsinger, a young man, had died of an experiment at, at, at the University of Pennsylvania, and Ellen um, Roach, had a, a, a young woman, 24, had died of an experiment at Johns Hopkins. And so the question was, you know, what about you know, should the uh, what's called the common rule? It's it's a rule of uh, that's that's shared by 19, at least at the time, we're shared by 19 different agencies of the federal government, uh, whether it should be revised or not, and in what ways. Um, and in, and while I was on that commission, um, now this will either be comforting comforting to you or not. Um, uh, I found out that every single um, drug that's used for children. Um, is really just a, a, a drug that was a, was approved for adults, and then pediatricians figured out what the dosage should be, uh, because nobody, no, no drug company wants to take the liability of um, of experimenting on children. Same sort of thing with pregnant women, right? That the, the drugs dealing with pre with pregnant women um, are really approved for adults generally, and and uh, gynecologists and obstetricians. You know, do what they can to try to figure out whether they're safe for for women who are pregnant, uh, and a lot of it is, um, you know, is a question of experience um, and not double blind studies and things like that. Um, so this kind of issue, um, which uh, raises all kinds of very important questions about respect for persons and con what is informed consent and what uh, and and how does um, and what level of risk um, is is involved, and, how, and to what extent does the patient know it, right? When undertaking that risk, uh, and to what extent is it really consent? I mean, if your sergeant tells you you're a private in the army, your sergeant tells you you're going to be part of this experimental therapy, right? Is that consent? Or if you're in jail, and you have a sense that if you you volunteer for this experiment that you'll get out of jail faster. Is that really consent? Even though you're told that it's not gonna have any, anything to do with your prison sentence, if, but you think that it will, is that really consent? Mm -hmm. um, so all of these kinds of moral questions about um, human experimentation uh, come to the fore in these kinds of new, uh, new technologies. On the other hand, if we don't do experiments on human beings, then we'll never know um, whether they're safe, and then everybody's a guinea pig, right? So there needs to be, and that's what the IRB system is all about, right? There needs to be a system whereby we uh, maximize the amount of knowledge and consent involved in the experiments and minimize the risks to the people involved to the extent that we can, knowing that some, some of these are going to go awry. I mean, that's the nature of uh, an unproved um, intervention. Yeah. 
that that's a, a, a dilemma that uh, when I was doing bone marrow transplants that we had all, all the time, we would have our, our patient with a, a disease, say leukemia, that without appropriate treatment was, was, was going to be fatal. And we come to them and we say, we have a treatment, a bone marrow transplant that has high likelihood of being curative, um, but it's not 100%. And these are all of the different complications that could potentially occur, potentially occur. Well, once we said the word that this is a potential cure, the patient's mind is, is closed. Right. They don't hear all that comes afterwards. And then unfortunately, later on, they get through the transplant, all the difficulties, they get through it. And then they develop some very serious complications. They say, hey, no one ever told us that this could happen. I didn't think it would ever be like this. Um, so as you said, the issue of, of what is truly informing a patient and what's informed consent, it can be very challenging. Yeah. Okay, Judy, uh, any other questions? Yes, so I, I think this will be our last question, but it's an interesting one. Um, because we can now tell so much genetically um, in the neonatal stages of life. Someone pointed out dentists, um, children's dentists were being pressured to report to insurance companies if they could detect that there would be future problems um, and sort of making them pre-existing conditions so that insurance companies would be off the hook for treating children who perhaps in utero you could tell had a chance of developing certain diseases. Where where does the line draw about how we handle that and, and how information is shared? That, that's a, a, a tough issue and, mm -hmm. and a, a real concern that, that uh, getting this gi genetic diagnostic information could be misused and in, 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 in potentially employment issues. But more so, as you said, insurance and, and pre-existing conditions. Uh, Ellen, is that something you, you, you deal with in your practice? Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, none of the patients I see, my reports do not go into the medical file. It's sort of, uh, I guess it's legal. I was told that this is perfectly fine to do. But the medical file does not. It might say they had genetic testing for cancer genes or for whatever panel it was, whatever I was looking at, but the result is not there. It's kept in a separate lock file. Uh, you're not allowed to discriminate. Insurance companies are not allowed to discriminate on the basis of positive genetic testing. You're not allowed to lose your job over that. There's no such provision for things like life insurance and disability insurance. So if you get a positive genetic test that you were very likely to have a particular genetic disease. I'm thinking of cancer at the moment. They're allowed to discriminate based on that, on, um, on disability and life insurance, but not medical insurance. And uh, I'm fortunate that I can keep it out from the medical record. That's the current state of affairs, which doesn't seem quite fair, but that's the way it is right now. Well, uh, even, even the protecting people in terms of medical insurance is just is a result of HIPAA, right? Yeah. Which was uh, 1999 or something at the, at the end of the Clinton administration, right? Um, so even that is rather new. So I, I think we've uh, run out of time. Judy, do you want to... Uh close out the session? Uh, um, I just want to thank our panel for a really interesting and um, discussion that I think has brought up, answered the qu many questions and brought up many others for continued debate, which is part of what we hope the Sinai and Synapse series does. Um, we want to thank everyone who joined us this evening for um, engaging in this program. You should know that this will be posted on the PJTC YouTube site if um, you know people who are not able to turn in tonight. And also it will be on the Sinai and Synapses site. Um, and again, you can go to sinainsynapses.org 
when you visit your, their site, you can sign up. They have weekly updates. They have um, fascinating um, other discussions. Uh, Bonnie Brody, one of our congregants, has an article posted right now on their site. So I strongly urge you to go see it. Um, our next program, by the way, is going to be on March 15th, a Sunday morning, and it's going to be um, uh, Dr. Christine Garraway is going to be looking at what we know from Torah and what we know from archaeology and where they overlap and where they don't quite overlap. Um, so that should be really interesting. And her field of study is especially looking at children in the Middle East. And so that to give you a teaser, uh, being a child in the ancient world was not necessarily all fun and games. Mm -hmm. So um, we strongly um, suggest that you uh, tune in to Dr. Christine Garraway, who will be talking on March 15th. Again, thank you so much to everyone on the panel and thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, right. everybody. Good night. Good night. Um, anyway, thank you all very, very much. It was a great discussion. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm seeing, I assume John is still with us. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Right. Yep. Good night. Good night. You, you okay. can. Okay. What?